a work in concert with Charles Communications Associates, which is the PR and marketing agency for the Consorzio di Coniliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore. And we are excited to have you join us. Our main mission, um, everything that CCA does, is about bringing the messages about Prosecco Superiore to you, the influencers, the ones who matter in the trade. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, I am also very excited to welcome Mr. John McDaniel, um, who is an advanced sommelier, and he is very familiar with Prosecco Superiore. He has traveled to the region um, at least once, I think multiple times. Um, and he's going to put on a great program for you. Um, I do want to remind everybody, and in the chat bar, I'm going to load in the uh, social um, tag. So if you want to take a photo of the screen, um, if you want to take photos of the bottle that you're drinking and share it on Instagram, um, there's, we're going to get to a slide that will have it all, all on there, but I will type it in, um, in here. Uh, Instagram is at Prosecco CV. And we would also ask uh, at All the Swirl, which is Charles Communications Associates. And then we will share everything from there. On Facebook, you can find the consortium at, whoops, sorry. It's kind of a long one, but if you search for it, it pops right up. Just make sure you've got that DOCG in there. Um, and again, all the swirl on Facebook as well. We would love to see all your posts. On Twitter, same, we've got at Prosecco CV and at Charles Com. So have at it. Um, I think we're gonna kick this off um, with a short video. It's about two minutes, but it's a nice way to get oriented to the area and see what it looks like if you haven't been. And if you haven't been, it's gonna make you wanna go. So bear with me, I'm gonna do a screen share here. Oh, sorry, let me get rid of this. Can everybody see that? The Prosecco Superiore landscape are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This small rural area between Venice and the Dolomites is home to thousands of wine producers who have been looking after it for generations. It is thanks to their work that this naturally arduous and fragile landscape has become a unique setting of immense and breathtaking beauty. There are three characteristics of universal value to be protected and enhanced. The morphology of its hills, which are arranged in cordons that run from east to west, forming a series of steep, rugged slopes interspersed with small, parallel positioned valleys. Over the centuries, man has learned to adapt to their peculiarities shaping the steep slopes while perfecting agricultural techniques. Cilioni. Hi everybody, I think that there was a little screen sharing problem there. You can hear the beautiful sounds of it though, so that's, uh, we at least got that part of it going on. So sorry, of course, it doesn't want to work the minute you need it to work. Um, bear with me here. Sorry about this. There we go. We can see it now. Can you see the video? Oh, Your desktop now. Well, of course, it's always. Um, Everyone, I definitely encourage you to, as we are getting this started, Definitely pop your first bottle uh, if you have one in front of you. Get a, get a little uh, Prosecco Superiore DOCG in your glass. Uh, and so we'll, we'll cheers the beginning of this, but 
no sense in waiting. Uh, we'll certainly get into the details of all these wines uh, here in a bit and uh, more about the region. But as uh, everyone is getting settled, looks like if you haven't already started, uh, definitely pour something in your glass and uh, we'll, be, we'll be with you here in a second. So cheers, everybody. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. The hills of Corneliano Valdobbiadene, the Prosecco Superiore landscape, are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This small rural area between Venice and the Dolomites is home to thousands of wine producers who have been looking after it for generations. It is thanks to their work that this naturally arduous and fragile landscape has become a unique setting of immense and breathtaking beauty. There are three characteristics of universal value to be protected and enhanced. The morphology of its hills, which are arranged in cordons that run from east to west, forming a series of steep, rugged slopes interspersed with small, parallel positioned valleys. Over the centuries, man has learned to adapt to their peculiarities, shaping the steep slopes while perfecting agricultural techniques. The Ciglioni, particular types of terrace held up not with stones, but with grassy soil that blend in with the landscape while helping to reinforce the slopes. The development of a patchwork agricultural landscape in which many small vineyard plots belonging to different families are interspersed with woodlands and meadows and that functions as an effective ecological network. The hills of Conigliano Valdobbiadine, a landscape worth living, a heritage that belongs to us all. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. John McDaniel. Thank you, everybody. A pleasure to be with everyone. Uh, it's really exciting to kind of talk about, you know, this very beautiful area that, uh, as Liz mentioned, uh, I've been a couple times and been able to go through uh, all of the amazing uh, vineyards and uh, eat the food and meet the people and the most amazing gelato spot in the entire world uh, is this little place called Gelateria, which is in a garage uh, right in Valdo Biadene. So I definitely uh, encourage you when we can all uh, go back to uh, those points uh, and join uh, the rest of the world and to uh, be able to go there to uh, those areas that's uh, where we all hope to go. So uh, really what we're uh, gonna hope to do with this uh, particular uh, Zoom tasting is to really for uh, you in the trade, you know, we get a lot of questions, whether it be on a restaurant floor in a retail shop uh, or with our other, uh, you know, sommelier friends or other trade or consumers of all of the different ways that when we think of Prosecco, what exactly does Prosecco mean? And why does the $8.99 bottle of Prosecco that you see uh, you know, in a retail shop, why is that different than what we're gonna be talking about here today? And what we're gonna be talking about is definitely one of the most special areas uh, in the entirety of uh, Italy uh, and one of the most special areas for the production of wine. As you can see just in the video that started already, uh, what you think of as you know, a, an area where you can just grow as many grapes as humanly possible uh, and to make millions and millions and millions of bottles of uh, just easy uh, frizzante and sparkling wine. Uh, that is not what we're talking about. Uh, the topography hill here, the hillsides, uh, the ability to, you know, grow everything and do everything by hand uh, is the only option for some of these hills uh, and the amount of hours and the amount of work that goes into uh, this particular area. So what we're talking about is uh, a DOCG, uh, Conigliano Valdo Biadene Prosecco Superiore. Uh, started as, a, um, you know, as an organization in 1876 and one of the most historical areas in Italy for wine production uh, when you look at uh, you know, this methodology here. And so uh, you'll see as I'm sharing the screen here for uh, the slide deck that we have a ton of information. And what is amazing about this particular area is, you know, that the, the consortium itself has gathered so many different resources, as you've seen through uh, some of you that received some of the wines, the, the books that came in, the maps, the slide decks, the, the, all the different information. 
these are the things to share with your staff. These are the things to share with your guests of giving all of those little bits of information about why is Prosecco Superiore DOCG so important to Italian sparkling wine, to Italian wine, and to uh, any possible wine list and the cost that goes into it. And so hopefully uh, here we can kind of grow into a little bit of an understanding of what that really means. And so when we look at who we are, uh, you know, not all Prosecco is created equal. And so that's really the lesson that we can pull from this is that what your guests are thinking for that easy by the glass wine. Uh, this is another layer here. This is another way, uh, you know, to share these wines. And we definitely encourage you to do that uh, through this tasting and through sharing it with uh, your guests uh, when you're back in front of them and with your staff, uh, with your sommelier friends uh, and, and trade. So really when we look at this area, um, you know, in northeastern Italy, so whether you're flying into Milan or you're flying to Venice, we're going to go about halfway kind of in between here into the area of uh, Conigliano and Valdobbiadene. And so when we look at Prosecco DOC, it's a really broad area here that encapsulates both uh, the Veneto region and also Friuli. But when we're talking about DOCG here, we're really talking about the Veneto. We're talking about this area, the northern hillsides uh, above Venice, uh, uh, you know, going northeast of Verona, into this area here of some of the most, you know, really special uh, hillsides that are right between Venice and the Dolomites. So all of this topography here that was really created uh, over the course of millions of years, and we see how much of this has been carved out here, that really on its own, uh, you know, is divided in between kind of two, uh, you know, special tiers. And so we're going to be talking about uh, this special tier of uh, Valdobbiadene and uh, Canigliano here. So uh, it's broken down into 15 different communes. And so when we look at that, it's these 15 different communes, and then we have different tiers and different qualities that go in here. And so we have, you know, if we look at the entirety of Prosecco, uh, the base of that being Prosecco DOC, then we go into a solo DOCG above that, and then we get into our quality pyramid here. And so of all of that, you know, our largest production uh, of DOCG wines are going to be just labeled as Canigliano Valdobbiadene. Then we get into those more kind of special tiers there, whether it be uh, the specific Rive or that Superior di, di Cartizze. So that really one special vineyard when we talk about the Grand Cru aspect, uh, that's that top of the top there. That's a subzone of about 108 hectares uh, that are in that kind of area there. So really that's how we're kind of dividing here of we look at Prosecco on its own and then we get more specified, more special, more unique into this kind of top three areas here of that quality pyramid uh, into that. I certainly welcome people as we're going through this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, certainly we'll be monitoring the chat and the, and the Q&A and uh, we can bring you into that at any time as well. So uh, in addition to the tasting uh, and to the wine that you have in front of you, uh, certainly any questions that you have, uh, you can certainly do that as well. So as we see here, just, you know, what's great about this deck is that it's not just information, but that all different kinds of, uh, of photos are, are in here. And when we kind of stand at the, at the peak or the tops of these hills and look down, we certainly see that, uh, you know, when we're picking these vineyards, when we're managing them, you know, you have to strap into the rope and uh, a lot of uh, work has to be done there. So really the question is, again, to the beginning of why are we going into this, you know, particular area of Prosecco? Why are we going into, you know, this? Why is the division necessary? Well, we can certainly blame Paris Hilton for that and the, the creation of all the laws of Prosecco. And so I invite you to Google the Paris Hilton Prosecco story at one point. Uh, but really, you know, why this particular DOCG and why the consortio has spent so much time, so much money and so much energy into creating its own entity and to marketing it as such is that Prosecco, much like champagne, is looked at as just a broad category. It's synonymous as Band-Aid is to bandage as Kleenex is to tissue. And really that's not the case. When we look at these wines here, Prosecco Superiore, DOCG, it's not just synonymous with sparkling wine from Italy. It is a very subsection, a very special area here. And so I'm gonna to continue to bat that into you of how superior, how superiore it is. And so really that kind of starts uh, at the hillsides themselves. So if you were to drive on the A4 from Venice to Milan, you're going through and you're seeing kind of all these vineyards on the side, on, on the roadside, in the valleys, all just kind of propagated and, you know, yields are the most important part there. That is really where we're looking at, you know, kind of that really high production, you know, high volume areas here of the potential DOC into growing glare. Where we're at here is up in the hillsides. And so the hills 
are really in the ideal position for growing a really type of special wine. So in the foothills of the Alps, kind of pocked in there between Venice and the Dolomites, you know, this is a special area and the temperatures here uh, are specifically grown for, or specific for, you know, this beautiful style of wine that creates really warm days and those really cool nights. So we have that really great diurnal swing there to create high acidity, to balance out the ripeness, to create beautiful sparkling wines. And that's what we're looking for is that low sugar levels when we're picking, but really kind of high acidity here. And so as we see, you know, really substantial rainfall, all of these things are going into how to produce fantastic glare. So we see in between the, the base there and the top uh, of these hillsides, from 50 to 500 meters. So we see, and that aspect there is, is pretty extreme as well. So the other thing that makes this area so special is the six different, you know, uh, kind of pocket areas and the five different soils that we're looking at here. And really from east to west, creating that, you know, really special. So when we have just Valdobbiadene wines, and then we look at Cartizia and we look at these different zones, you know, each of these create very special soil types here that create very different wines. And so hopefully with the wines that you taste in front of you, uh, that we can see some you know, different areas here between the area of Val de Biadene, of Santo Stefano, uh, and of Cartice. So we notice these uh, different soil types here, these uh, you know, very special from more kind of calcium carbonate to a more kind of clay and the glacial origin of that kind of moving through all of these is uh, definitely what makes it a, a special area. I'm gonna keep saying that over and over again, special area, special area. Your goal now after this hour, hour 15, is to put this down into the 15 second version of it for your guests. And that's the one thing to kind of pull out of this is the visual images of how to kind of translate that as well. So obviously it being a handcrafted wine, so the, the typical, when we think of the growing season, when we think of harvest, uh, the amount of hours that it takes to go through a vineyard, uh, through a harvest team, you know, this hectare is in here takes about 600 hours worth uh, of work which is opposed to about 150 for kind of the normal average vineyard. So just the man hours that go into that, the risk that goes into that, and you'll see some pictures uh, of some of the harvesting uh, a bit later. And the fact that, you know, all of these are family run, even the largest estates uh, and the largest vineyard holdings within uh, Canigliano and Valdobbiadene uh, are all family run. Uh, so even kind of the, our larger uh, producers, which we have a couple of these kind of in the later tastings as well, you know, really looking at, again, the, the unique aspect of this. So it's not just, uh, you know, producing 50 million bottles off in a factory somewhere uh, outside of Venice. Uh, you know, these wineries are steeped into the tradition of the area. So as we see here, kind of these training lines for the grapes, still done to this day, very traditional. It's kind of reminds you of uh, almost, you know, of uh, some of the wineries in Germany, some of the vineyards in Germany as well. Just these really kind of steep areas here. So all of this, again, as we said uh, in the beginning, started around 1876. So we're looking at the first school of winemaking uh, was founded in Conigliano, and really from all over uh, Italy and all over the world. This is right around the time that Italy as a country was really starting. And so all of these different viewpoints, all of these things come together into one area, into one uh, kind of goal of this, you know, beautiful, beautiful setting uh, for education about how to uh, start wine. And so in 1923, that kind of shifted uh, into uh, the Institute for Viticulture Experimentation, which again, how do we make the best wine possible? How do we utilize the technology at the time? How do we continue with that uh, traditional growing methods uh, that they have in this area here uh, into the shift into the 1960s uh, when the uh, consortium uh, was really started for Canagliano Valdobbiadene. So again, continuing to kind of push along here, uh, the DOC founded in 1969. And then it was the DOC, it changed in 2009 into really kind of coming into its own of being that high quality area and separating itself from DOC uh, Prosecco into what we refer to now as Canigliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore DOCG, which in itself is a mouthful. Uh, and so typically Valdobbiadene is what's uh, referred to as Prosecco Superiore DOCG, but just recognizing uh, that kind of difference there. And then the last part of that uh, in 2019 uh, was the last time uh, that, you know, the last thing that was uh, quite special here, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I'm going to stop the share on that for a second, kind of just join everybody again. Uh, and so we'll, we'll toast first uh, as we uh, get in our, in our first wine here. So everyone, thank you again for joining us. 
uh, and definitely pour whatever your first Prosecco Superiore uh, is here. So uh, cheers to everybody. And so we'll get into our first wine uh, here in a minute, but uh, Liz, do you see any uh, questions or anything that we can uh, start off with uh, at the moment or we can keep going as well? Um, yeah, there was, I think there was a question about the altitude, the maximum altitude of Cartizze, but it did, I think you might've answered that. Um, is so most- 500 you know, uh, meters there, yeah. Yeah, and I think a thousand feet is what I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. And is most DOC machine harvested as opposed to uh, DOCG, which of course has to be hand harvested? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, DOC Prosecco of the millions and millions of bottles that are produced, uh, how they are planting it, you know, uh, where they're setting new vineyards, uh, the growth of Prosecco, you know, they can't produce enough Prosecco DOC these, these days. And so that's why some of the laws have lacked a little bit for the DOC uh, to be able to, you know, grow production. That's the goal of the DOC, to grow production. The goal, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal of the DOCG is to grow quality. And so that really is, if we can say that there's one difference uh, between them to pass on to your guests, that really is where that mark of difference is, is, you know, as they're planting, you know, wider spacing for tractors and machines uh, to be able to go through uh, and machine pick, you know, that's not possible as you see uh, through some of these vineyards uh, that we have here in, uh, in the Valdo Biadone DOCG. So really continuing to focus on that, you know, the manual aspect uh, of everything from grape to glass. And speaking of the harvest, um, there's another question about how densely the vines are planted. Uh, so a lot of variety here when it comes to uh, planting densities. Uh, and so, you know, that's the one aspect of those that the numbers are kind of a, a pretty varied here. Uh, so if we look at, you know, you can just see from the pictures themselves of, you know, how densely planted some of these things are and mostly traditional planting. So you don't see a lot of new plantings in these areas in the DOCG. There are a lot of more traditional plantings which are focusing more uh, on high density to make the most uh, out of every possible, um, you know, hectare that they have for each of these producers as, as quality is, is the important part uh, of the DOCG. Okay, great. Kimberly just put a, a good factoid uh, in there about um, the 2,500 vines for, per hectare as well. So thanks for that uh, specific there, Kimberly. Yeah. All right. And then someone else asked about the um, allowance for any other grapes other than Glera. And I know we're going to get to that in the deck because there, there yes. are. And so continuing on to this, so we'll talk uh, again, it's uh, going into uh, from the vineyard to the glass right into that transition. So a great question. Uh, so for the DOCG Conigliano Valdo Biarone, uh, a minimum of 85% glare. So that is the grape of focus uh, for Prosecco. And so the, the synonymous aspect of Prosecco and glare there, there's a, a maximum of 15% of other varieties. You'll see in some of these wines of a percentage or two here of Verduzzo or uh, Bianchetta. Those are probably the two uh, kind of second and third uh, that are coming up. Uh, and then again, uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay uh, are able to be used as well. Uh, not a lot of that is used, but as we have seen in the news uh, here over the last, uh, you know, uh, couple weeks, uh, the ability to produce uh, Prosecco Rosato. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see uh, how P the growth of Pinot Noir uh, in some of these plantings are going to be able to grow. So, and depending on who you ask, uh, there is uh, certainly a lot of positive and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, not so uh, open to change uh, for bringing in a Rosé Prosecco, uh, as I think that they're doing things uh, quite well here traditionally. So. Uh, if you've met any uh, Italian uh, wine producers in, in your days, you certainly know that change uh, immediately is not something that uh, they're necessarily open to uh, immediately. So we look at the styles here, and uh, this has kind of changed a little bit uh, along with the Rosato. Uh, so classically, like, um, you know, when we look at the different residual sugar levels uh, and qualifications here, extra brute and brute are going to be the focus is really for most DOCG wines. Uh, you obviously... Uh, when we think of Prosecco DOC, we think of extra dry and dry, a lot more residual sugar here, a lot more of that kind of fruitier style. And that really is the goal of that style. The goal of the style of DOCG is to be as, as dry as possible, is to really show the aromatics, to show the natural uh, fruit uh, levels of these wines. And again, the acidity and the sparkling of it. So when we taste some of these wines as well, you'll notice that a lot of them have either zero dosage or very, very close to zero uh, to again, in the fashion of the DOCG, to produce, again, as bone-dry wines as possible with very limited uh, residual sugar there. 
Other styles include uh, a little bit of uh, frizzante, so uh, again, lower atmospheric so pressure or tranquilo, um, but really when we look at the focus here, uh, the, the breakout of what Prosecco Superior DOCG, again, shifting drier as possible, that extra dry, kind of teetering on that 12 grams uh, is you know, the, the kind of classic 12 to 15 in there for extra dry, and more kind of brute as we see uh, more producers that are coming out uh, with that kind of a style. And so we see here the, the top of the hill, the top of the production uh, for Prosecco Superiore DOCG is Superiore di Cartizze. So that one particular crew that only 108 hectares that make up these several different villages here, uh, Santo Stefano is one that we'll be tasting here uh, in a bit uh, in between Valdo Biondone and Santo Stefano. And really what we're looking here is multiple aspects between these, these hamlets, very ancient soils here that are mostly compiled of a lot of sandstone, a lot of clay, and again, a lot of uh, glacial uh, notes in here uh, that cause these really different aspects um, of this area here. So Cartice, anytime that you see that, um, you know, particularly labeling or particular designation uh, on a bottle, you know that that is the crew, that is the definitely the, the top of the top when we look at one specific site, one specific area here uh, of the Prosecco Superiore DOCG. Then we get into kind of the Rive. So again, when we look at our quality pyramid here, kind of the Rive kind of fits in between uh, just DOCG production and then uh, again, that Cartizze crew. Uh, so Rive refers really to the vineyards that are on the steepest of the hillsides here. Uh, so when we look at, again, handpicked uh, typically from a single municipality. So a single hamlet, single village uh, there. And this is really to kind of, again, look at how to, instead of a single vineyard, uh, to really a single style here. And so the more specificity, again, the DOCG looking for quality above everything else and looking for how to kind of designate uh, you know, itself in a very particular way. So Rive is another one of those denominations that really shows a more specific level of quality, a more specific designation there uh, that looks at um, you know, how to divide these wines into uh, you know, really the quality that is coming in. And then we look at the special nature of, I don't know who drew on my thing there, uh, the special nature of uh, our vineyard is our home. So looking at the sustainability. So really that's another one of the important things uh, of the DOCG itself uh, is that it's you know, commitment to uh, the agriculture, commitment to you know, low usage of agrochemicals, uh, low usage of sulfites, low usage of really kind of all chemicals in, it, in itself to really kind of drive Again, and natural, and I say that natural, not in production, but natural as far as, you know, the, the growth cycle of maintaining the vineyards in a sustainable nature as possible, uh, not necessarily focusing on organic certification, but traditional organic methods of, of viticulture and of production. That includes in 2019, uh, a ban on use of uh, glyphosate. So you can look uh, a little bit more into that uh, as well, but this is definitely uh, a driver continuously the consortio of, again, quality and sustainability is something that they're always, uh, you know, uh, quite pushing along uh, when it comes to their sustainability. And again, one thing that, you know, when we look at facts outside of the wine world and we look at why a, an area is so special, uh, in 2019, uh, this area of Dalubiarane and Punigliano uh, was classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so this is something that it doesn't matter if it's a vineyard uh, or a special site in the world. You know, this is a place that is going to be protected now uh, and the ability to do so and continue to grow the DOCG uh, in a way that is going to attract a lot of different interests from wine uh, people and people that are interested in travel. And so looking at uh, this you know, newer uh, UNESCO classification, uh, I think it's gonna be very important to how, you know, these uh, Prosecco areas are gonna be uh, continue to maintain and grow uh, its importance in the uh, wider broad sense of uh, the Italian wine world. And so we'll just scroll through here so you can see some of these numbers, you can read them all on your own. Let's get to the, the fun and the tasting aspect of this. Um, but as you can see here, the kind of divide uh, in the production of 90 million bottles overall, uh, and looking at how many of those are just you're classified as DOCG. And then we go into, again, the kind of reverse pyramid here down to Rive and then uh, the Superiore de Cartizze, um, you know, here in this area um, of the DOCG. So obviously uh, vastly 
uh, produced in just DOCG uh, for Cyclo Superiore wines and looking at how really special the Rive and the Cartice uh, classification is going to be. And 90%, 97% uh, of that is going to be sparkling, kind of this area here. The exports of which, uh, United States continuously to kind of move up that, but obviously the proximity of Germany, uh, the United Kingdom and Switzerland uh, in uh, exports as well. Uh, and so we, now we look at uh, where to buy and how it's different. So obviously all is, uh, you know, trade and sommeliers recognition of the DOCG. Uh, that is something that, you know, our consumers are growing to continuously know and continuously uh, know as appreciation uh, for high quality. Uh, and so we see here uh, the neck of the bottle, uh, the Canigliano Valdo um consortium logo here. And so we see an interesting fact I learned the other day. Uh, these dots that are kind of floating around here, there are 15 of them, uh, which equal the 15 communes. So uh, for our uh, advanced and, and master candidates that are out there, that's a great uh, master level uh, uh, question uh, that you can put on your next uh, test exam here. Uh, and so again, each of those volatiles is um, numbered and labeled as such. And again, reading the label, you can certainly go through this and you've read uh, this before, but just so you can kind of pass on for your staff uh, as well of some of these, you know, ways to kind of, um, you know, continuously showcase what Prosecco Superiore DOCG is all about. Storage and service, again, we can talk uh, to our blue in the face on, uh, you know, how to particularly store it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but, you know, it's really all about kind of allowing it to uh, express its aromatics. And I think uh, when we look at the different, uh, you know, styles of glassware, uh, something that kind of allows that aromatics is always uh, definitely very important. So we'll get into our first one. Um, the Dosaggio Zero uh, from Valdo Biadone, Prosecco Superiore DOCG from Drusian. So we'll come back here and we'll bring everybody so I can see all of your beautiful faces. <coughs> and so we'll see our first bottle there for, so some of you have about half of you will have this and half of you will have kind of the other set here. Uh, but our first bottle here, uh, so Dosa Zero as we talked about. Uh, so a really interesting producer uh, that's kind of Southwest uh, of the um, actual town of Valdo Biadone. And this is one of the largest landowners in the DOCG uh, and also one of the most historic. They've been producing wine uh, for over a hundred years in this area here. Uh, and so, you know, the first thing that for those of you that have it, would love to hear some of your comments as well. Uh, for those of you that have the Drusian, so you can, Kind of share with uh, those that don't uh, so we can uh, bring in some of the people here so anyone that has this wine would love to hear your initial thoughts of it <coughs> excuse me is everybody unmuted john everybody is muted at this point so if anyone knows how to do the raise hand function uh we can certainly do that or just wave uh that would be another way to uh, we can bring you in here. Anyone has, has a Drusian uh, that would love to bring in your comments, would love to hear uh, from some of our other sommeliers that uh, may have the wine. For myself, uh, you know, this is kind of a lighter, softer style to it. You know, you notice that there is fruit there. You don't really think of as when we say like Dosa Zero, that it's going to be super bone dry, very austere. It definitely has that roundness to it, a lot of kind of peach and pear notes to it. But it's still quite, quite lovely, quite approachable uh, as far as the style goes. All right, no volunteers, so. Oh, there we go, Brian will volunteer. Brian, what do we got for us? What do you think? Hey, hey. Um, you know, I think I see a lot of the, the same notes that I had for the wine, uh, what you spoke of. I, I really enjoy a sort of like softer, almost like smoky, like flinty note here, uh, which really gives some uh, added complexity and depth into that really clean, fresh, I mean, it is um, a very straightforward fruit to me, but it, I think, exemplifies, like, what you can do with Prosecco that's also, like, I love the zero dosage here. I think it just presents a little bit more of the, the earth, and you get a little bit more of that characteristic um, of the varietal, which, I mean, I know it's not known as a highly aromatic varietal, really, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more simple in that regard, but I think this is a great showing of uh, what it can do with that, um, that clean fruit. You know, it's pale lemon, a little really soft round bubble to it, and that green herb and fruit comes on the back as well, and that acidity for me, which is quite uh, lovely, is a little bit, uh, it sort of like flanks the palate. 
So it comes uh, a little bit more, not necessarily straight smacking in the face, but it comes back around and uh, keeps that, the, the finish and the length, uh, which are quite nice. Yeah, I love it. And definitely you get, uh, again, when you talk about the aromatics of it, uh, you know, I think that the, the soil types of this area, um, you know, really bring out uh, that particular. So where we're looking at right off of, uh, you know, southwest of all the Adonai, you know, a little bit more of that calcium carbonate. So we get a little bit more of that kind of chalkiness to it. We get a little bit, as you pointed out, that smokiness there is an awesome call uh, as well. Of just, you know, it's bright, it's fresh, uh, but really I think that you know, all of those things are uh, able to be highlighted by the fact that, uh, you know, it is still bone dry uh, and, you know, just really nice and balanced at the same time. I'm going to call uh, next on Mai, who uh, has some great comments uh, on this particular wine as well. So let's get you in there. Try and unmute you here. There we go. Yes. Hi, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I think this uh, Prosecco uh, give me a little bit of salinity and have some like she uh, seashell uh, characteristic to it. Again, like uh, emphasize on that flinty notes, like stone quality to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think really the, when I was looking at your comments and, you know, that seashell, that, that texture there uh, really comes through. So, you know, it's, it's a balance of that, uh, the fruit profile, but also that, that texture and acidity absolutely. absolutely especially for right now like the trend is um in many high-end restaurants they do a lot of like poached scallops or anything that scallop that's a little bit more raw style uh, so that would be quite good so. absolutely yeah that's a great call there all right let's get into our second one here uh so for those of you scoring along at home we're going to move on to the bianco Vigna. So also a uh, dosaggio zero, so zero dosage here. Uh, and again, this is one of my favorite producers um, from uh, the Rive area. Uh, so Rive designation here. And so really when we look at the history of this uh, producer, you know, Youthful in Bianco Vigne, uh, 2015 uh, was their uh, first vintage. Uh, but when we look at it, they've been growing as a family back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, and they're also part of the Casa Clima, which is a really interesting kind of subsection of producers that uh, are focusing on you know, sustainable agriculture, focusing more on uh, you know, organic uh, production, but also in the winery as well. So it's very similar to a, a Demeter certification as kind of I was reading more into it, uh, specifically to uh, producers in this area that are focusing on, you know, sustainability from the vineyard all the way up through carbon neutral footprints and all these things that are really important to kind of the whole aspect of uh, producing wine in this area here. So anyone that has the Banco Vigna would love to uh, hear some of your thoughts. So this is vintage 2018 uh, coming from Riva. And again, so dosage zero. So this is uh, Riva Solio. So for me, definitely a lot more texture and acidity uh, to this wine than uh, noticed in the first one. And so again, we look at the balance of brightness here, but there's a lot going on. So a little bit less of that kind of peachy and pear notes to it, a little bit more kind of apple-y fruit, yellow apple here, uh, a little bit more kind of uh, that skin note, <clears throat> skin note to it. But again, the aromatics of this one, just the intensity of this wine, uh, the concentration of this is definitely a lot more uh, than our first wine here that I noticed. Any brave souls who want to uh, join in the fun and share their notes about this wine? I see some people pouring it anyway, so we at least know that people got it. All right, well, we'll, we'll leave you to hold. Uh, if, you, if you feel brave to come in later, uh, we can certainly do that as well. So definitely we look at, you know, this Riva certification uh, and designation here again, more towards that concentration. We get a lot more of the, um, you know, the aspect of when we talk about the first one having this kind of seashell notes to it, that smokiness to it. This one has a lot more of that uh, intensity there. So Bianca Vigna, really a great producer uh, and, a, and a beautiful wine here for the Riva. So next we'll go to a wine, uh, La Colture, that this is a wine that I've served by the glass in my restaurants in the past. <clears throat> And so we have our Lecatoria here. And we can start off, if you do have this bottle, if you just want to bring it up here so that I can call you out, if nothing else. 
because no one is volunteering. So I'm going to volunteer you now. <laughs> Tiffany, I see you there. So I'm going to call on you in a second. So you better get ready. <clears throat> so what I always love about this wine and pouring it by the glass for my guests in the past is looking at how this wine can kind of bridge the gap. It brings people kind of all together as far as you know, it, the really intense mousse here, this is one that you can get a Prosecco drinker, a Cava drinker, someone that is familiar with the DOCG wines and champagne kind of all together uh, into one glass of wine. And so really concentrated, aromatic, uh, really kind of a, a fine but intense mousse here. <clears throat> and so Tiffany, I, I told you that I was gonna call on you. So what do you, what do you notice out of this wine? I'm gonna unmute you here and, uh, and see what you think of it. I think it's really approachable. It's definitely a friendly wine. You could put this in front of somebody that's going to eat pretty much any type of food. I have a lot of dogs, sorry. Um, it's really, really fruity at the same time as being friendly. Sorry, I have big dogs. No, it's, um, it's, it's definitely beautiful. I can see how this would do amazing on a bottle, for, I mean, on by the glass program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what you will notice about this one, uh, you know, compared to the first two, when we look at how we transition this tasting as well. The first two wines being zero dosage here, you know, really low sugar levels. And then we move right into a uh, brute style. So this is about nine grams per liter. And so we can see automatically the intensity of that. We notice the fruit profile of it, how it really kind of grows uh, into, you know, a wine that's more concentrated. Definitely the fruit, we can kind of, that perceived sweetness there, that perceived fruitiness, we can really tell uh, automatically. So that's a lot Tori. This is Valde Biadene, and this is again a brute style, so about nine grams per liter uh, on that one. Cool. So I know a few of you uh, have this already. So the next one that we'll move into is the Masotina. So a really small producer here, but beautiful, beautiful wines from this producer. So this is their Rive. <clears throat> And this comes uh, from Oliano, so uh, the little hamlet of Oliano in, in Rive. And anybody have, who, ha who are my Psalms out there that have this bottle? So we have Maya, we have Brian, Angela, I see you've got that there. So let's taste this wine. And so comparatively, we can see kind of between the two Rive. So this one is going to have a lot more residual sugar. This is about 15 and a half uh, grams per liter here. So we're in that brute style. And automatically in the nose, the aromatics of this are uh, very, very different. So of all the styles that you can see, in the DOCG, there's a lot of different applications here. And especially if you have a tasting menu or you're tasting several different sparkling wines uh, you know, throughout the course of an evening, there are multiple pairing applications. So for something like a Dosa Zero, as Maya pointed out earlier, you know, having like poached scallops or something of that nature. And then we move into something of a brute style here, a little bit more fruit forward, a little bit more round as far as the style goes uh, into some different foods. So what do we notice about this wine from any uh, brave soul out there? Brent, I see you smelling it. So am I gonna have to call on you? I'm gonna call on Brent. Brent, what do we got today? How are you doing in DC? <laughs> uh, socially distancing very safely in DC, just like everyone else. Um, for me, this has like kind of a cool, like a uh, menthol, almost eucalyptus thing. That's very refreshing. The fruit instead of like a uh, peach, like juice or something like that is more like a peach skin. There's like kind of a little bit of a, I don't know, like a slight bitterness to it, but not in a, uh, overwhelming type of way. I mean, the fruits there, it's in balance. This wine comes across as super clean, so it can serve a ton of purposes in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely more of a texture and more of a savory note to this. And so Brent, with all the cool stuff that you're doing uh, in DC, how do you find just, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot here about how Prosecco Superiori DOCG uh, kind of has, has fit into your programs in the past and, and really uh, what, what your guests are perceiving, you know, this versus uh, DOC or versus Champagne. How, how do these wines uh, fit into what you're doing there? I mean, they fit in just kind of the way that you, portrayed it where you have to tell people like hey before you even talk I know why you think this is gonna suck but this is why it doesn't which is kind of like when I talk to people about good Lambrusco like mm -hmm. before I can even entertain them about liking it I have to tell them why it's why it's why it sucks but this one doesn't suck and then that builds some uh you know rapport with the guests that I've 
that I know their misconception and I know why they may have been hazed by terrible versions in the past. And also on my wine list, I've found that if I label it Glara, people think it's way hipper and they're on to like the next cool thing <laughs> instead of calling it Prosecco. So, I mean, sure. I don't know how the, you know, the winemakers or the region or the Appalachian feels about that, but I mean, the, Millennial drinkers right now want to feel cool, and I guess sometimes Glara just gets that foot in the door. Yeah, and I think any any opportunity to to educate and show, you know, obviously for so long uh, most people thought and just how it was uh, labeled and marketed was Prosecco as the varietal, uh, as you know it was made from Prosecco, and now the more specificity of actually calling it Glara, uh, I think that's you know a great idea of you know there's certainly some bottlings out there that I know that actually have Glara on uh, the label itself. Um, but certainly, you know, the more that we can bring attention to uh, some of these wines, uh, you know, make them think that they're uh, getting educated and that they're, you know, bringing it back to you, as you said, of uh, being more hip and more cool than, uh, than we thought they were being. As Absolutely. Well, Brandon, Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks for your time, as always. So next, we'll move into uh, Ruggieri. So again, a really cool kind of traditional producer here, uh, and this is their Val de Biadene. So good. And when we look at moving up the scales of residual sugar and of dosage here, this is going to be a extra dry. So we're moving 17 uh, grams per liter here. And definitely, again, we notice in the aromatics and the intensity there automatically just kind of coming out. But what I've always loved about this one is that even though it is an extra dry, it always kind of drinks drier, um, you know, than what the actual label would be. So, you know, as I smell it, we notice that minerality there. We notice, uh, you know, the, the brightness of this. And so this is uh, in this is the 18 vintage, and so this is actually 100 years. And so you'll see this on the bottle as well, uh, the little 100 year designation of being in production. And so again, when we look at most of the producers here that we see uh, that are the the kind of tried and true producers in the DOCG, I have been here for a long time old vines, old, old production methods. And so really focusing on, you know, the traditions of the area. And so I think that that really, you know, looks at how these wines are very savory. You know, again, we're looking at how flexible these are with uh, the ability to pair with food. Uh, and then that kind of, uh, that brightness there. So I noticed that uh, our wonderful wine goddess in Las Vegas, Kat, has posed a really interesting question. So I'll kind of open this up to the group uh, first. Uh, and your notice of, you know, how, how the sugar balance here, how that kind of, uh, you know, balances into the aromatics. And if anyone has any thoughts before I uh, shoot in my own thoughts of the question really, how does the, the sugar enhance aromatics in glare or in, uh, in Prosecco? So if anyone has any thoughts on that, give a little wave. We're all shy and hanging and chilling today. That's cool. So for me, uh, I noticed that, you know, when we look at the, uh, you know, Prosecco Superior DOCG wines that have uh, that more intensity as far as a higher dosage, you know, it's looking at, I think the focus there is, yes, it has a higher dosage, but still it's almost, you know, increasing, you know, the, the acidity and this kind of aromatic. So if we're turning the treble up, you know, a little bit more, <clears throat> there are other things kind of going on. So in the production of, picking it kind of a little bit lower and then dosaging it on the back end a little bit higher to create, you know, high acidity, high brightness. And so those aromatics are kind of lifted by the sugars. Excuse me. So anyone else on the Ruggieri want to share their thoughts uh, in the tasting here? So this one definitely a perception of sweetness here. Kat, can I ring in here? Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of those where yes, there's perceptible sweetness or sugars to it, but there's really that kind of nice zingy finish to it that's more on that citrus side, where you start with these great aromatics. Mm -hmm. The texture, you know, I, I like to say creamy, dreamy to my guests usually because they, for Love some it. reason, like that term. But but it is. It's it's this great coating mouthfeel, but then it kind of cleans through and you finish with this little zestiness so even with that perceptible and you said 17 grams right yeah that's yeah yeah i, think I like we, it yeah definitely and i think you know it's still balanced and you know there is a, a great fruit profile too we get you know I, I saw lemon curd and you know uh those kind of flavors of 
you know, it's like lemon meringue pie, but, uh, you know, a really kind of a nice and balanced one. So uh, really fresh and uh, a beautiful wine here from uh, Ruggieri. So, and again, the alcohol level is in check too. It's 11 and a half. So I think we noticed, you know, kind of uh, sweetness and alcohol kind of balanced in there. And last but certainly not least, <coughs> so we see our six wines. So half of you got three of these, half of you got the others. Colvortas. And so this is a dry style. So 19 vintage here and newly released. Uh, and so this one is 24 grams per liter. So again, uh, really growing that intensity of the aromatics and of the sugar levels here. Let's get this in the glass. And automatically for me, the, the citrusy notes here, there's like, it's uh, a lot of key lime for me. Kind of a, a lot of stone fruits as well. So again, when we look at the intensity of aromatics here, uh, really, really beautiful. So this is uh, in between Valdobbiano Day and San Stefano. Uh, and so we get, again, uh, a little bit more of clay uh, on the soil type here. So we get a little bit more intensity here. So the balancing of the minerality of that intensity of the soil type, I, I think really balances into the dry style of this wine uh, to be able to have a little bit more of that residual sugar, to have a little bit more of that kind of uh, rounder aromatics to it uh, also. Anyone want to share their thoughts on this wine? Mm. Brian, we'll come back to you, our brave soul. Hey, um, I was actually kind of surprised by this wine because when I first opened it, I wasn't super in love with it, but it's as it's taken on some degrees, it's really come into this sort of like plush, like fleshy, almost that like stone fruit, papaya, guava, like tropical fruit, which is quite fun. And part of that is that the viscosity that you get from the dosage. Uh, like you said, we we're at 24 grams per liter. Um, but you, again, what I think is really fantastic as we look through these wines, even as we add on the residual sugar, the acidity retention, because of that beautiful diameter change, really holds through the structure of the wine. So yes, you're feeling the intensity of the sugar and maybe a little bit more roundness uh, and florality for the fruit, but you're still getting like, when you open your mouth again, that acidity like floods through and your mouth just like gushes. Okay. Uh, and I do get like a little bit of like, like earthy almost wool in here as well. Um, I don't know, yeah. uh, along with like the baking spice app like uh, baked apple uh, and that that great earthiness mm -hmm. um, sort of the salinity minerality that comes through here as well even with uh, again that dosage no absolutely and this, there's this a lot going on. There, absolutely yeah there's a lot going on in this wine and uh, I think when we look at you know for for you how do you think that uh, your your kind of traditional sparkling wine uh, you know, fan would react to a, a wine like this? I think that they would be surprised knowing that it's Prosecco uh, because of the depth and complexity to it. Uh, I think they would also be surprised at the amount of sugar that's in the wine if we even got there, but the perception of sugar for us is quite present, but I feel like if you were bringing this to a guest, uh, they that wouldn't be the first thing because I'm still getting like the pings here, you know, it's still resounding. And um, what did uh, what did Kat say? She said the zing at the end, right? Uh, creamy, dreamy zing. So you've got that nice mouth feel. I'm gonna, I'm totally stealing that cat, just so you're aware. <laughs> I'll credit you, have no fear. Um, and I think that they would maybe even go to a, oh, is this champagne because of how much is going on, mm -hmm. even though you don't for our, like on our side, of course, like we don't get the classic method because that's not the, the same method used here, but, uh, the complexity that is derived from that, I think is reminiscent of something that people associate with champagne or Franciacorta, if we want to say in Italy specifically. Sure, absolutely. 
Yeah, and this uh, shifts to another great question that Kat have, uh, has on, uh, you know, the elevation, how does that really affect uh, the flavor profile? And I think that, you know, that is partially having to do with location and partially having to do uh, with the, the fermentation and production method. You know, looking at where each of these wines sits and the huge gradient here, what I've noticed in wines that I taste that are uh, definitely higher in elevation, typically I've seen more of those move towards that kind of dosage zero or uh, looking at kind of the more bone dry styles or kind of lower elevation. Uh, but still, we're looking at hillside fruits here. You know, those are the ones that typically I notice more in the extra dry or the dry style. So the ripeness uh, of the grapes that are kind of in lower elevation here, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, kind of the, the heat that kind of uh, pockets into all the different aspects and kind of it creates almost this bowl that we see in so many different areas here. Uh, so really kind of higher the elevation goes, I think, you know, acidity grows a little bit and also, uh, you know, the tendency uh, for those wines to be uh, a little bit on the drier or produce uh, in a drier style, shifting towards brute, extra brute and kind of that uh, dosage zero. So a uh, really great question. So Kat, as always, thank you for that. So as we kind of wrap up uh, all the wines that we're tasting here, uh, to send back and to uh, thank all of the uh, consortia for sending us all wine, we're going to do a little uh, screenshot here, photo that any uh, Prosecco Superiore DOCG wine that uh, you have here this evening, you just want to kind of bring it up and toast the camera and we'll get a little screenshot there to, to, th to thank them and Liz will uh, send this back to Italy. We know that we're all thinking of them and hopefully sooner than later uh, being able to uh, share a bottle with them uh, there as well. So appreciate everybody for doing a little bit of social for that. Yeah. I'm going to get one more. One, two, three. Awesome. Excellent. Um, oh, hang on. I have to get to screen two. Uh oh. Well, I, and I know nobody knows which screen you're on. So if you could, everybody, do it one more time. One, two, three. And I'll give it vertical. One, two, three. That's terrific. Um, and I will also say we will send this deck to you through via a Dropbox link so that you can have it for future reference. Um, I think, John, you did an awesome job as usual. Any, any other questions? I think we might. John, you got the, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, and Kimberly Charles is on here um, of Charles Communications Associates. So please let us know if you have any questions. You can always email um, uh, kcharles at charlescommunication at charlescom.com um, or liz at charlescom.com or just press at charlescom.com right here. We can we can work with that too. There we go. John, do you have any parting words for everybody? No, I think that, you know, uh, as we all know, in these uh, crazy difficult times, the more that we can all get together and toast on uh, amazing things. So certainly for everyone uh, in taking your time to be here uh, this evening and, and enjoy some Prosecco Superiore DOCG, you know, really when we look at, you know, how to, ex you know, take all of this information and to, you know, bring it down into something that is, you know, easily shareable to our staff, easily shareable to our guests, you know, really it's about quality, you know, it's about bringing this particular area here and showing your guests something that is new and changing their minds about what the word Prosecco means and the addition of Superiore D-O-C-G, just those, uh, you know, two little, uh, you know, blips there can really make a difference and to, you know, showcase uh, different levels uh, of wine in this area and how special this area is and how the producers are, are doing such amazing things, uh, I think is a lot different than what most people would think of when we think of Prosecco. So, as always, it is our job to tell stories. Uh, and so thank you all for uh, joining in this little story. And again, any questions that you may have afterwards, most of you know how to get a hold of me uh, as well. If uh, not, I can uh, certainly connect you with, uh, with Kimberly and the great team at Charles Communications. And thank you, Liz, and to Kimberly and to Kristen uh, for having me as a part of this. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everybody and have a very safe Monday, happy week, and happy upcoming 4th of July and all that stuff too. So uh, hopefully some of these will, will save uh, for a couple of days for you too. So cheers, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.